Ken Pierce has been referred to as the guru of Yellowstone geology, for good reason. He was not shy about tackling the big geologic questions in Yellowstone. Over five decades, Ken investigated the driving forces that shaped the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. He was a geomorphologist, but he interacted with diverse disciplines in order to understand the earth processes that created the dramatic earthscape we call Yellowstone. He won the prestigious Kirk Bryan Award for his professional paper on the glaciation of Yellowstone. He was instrumental in verifying the track of the Yellowstone hotspot as a stationary mantle plume overridden by the North American tectonic plate and forming the eastern Snake River Plain. He studied the interaction of the subsurface mantle plume with the overlying landscape and climate. He hypothesized inflation and deflation of the Yellowstone caldera and utilized archaeology to help date the changes in shoreline levels. He deciphered massive flood deposits previously thought to be glacial moraines and showed the terrain sculpting power of catastrophic Yellowstone floods at the end of the last Pleistocene glaciation. After graduating from Yale in 1964, Pierce joined the United States Geological Survey. With his wife Linda, they loaded their two young kids and the family dog and cat into the VW Bug and moved the household to the regional office in Denver. One of Ken's first assignments was to map the glacial moraines in and around Yellowstone National Park. We're here on the uh, summit of Mount Washburn, which is in the central part of Yellowstone, just north of the center. And we're looking to the south, uh, and the first big thing we see is the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone with its bright colors. That's all cut into a half million year old rocks. And then beyond that is Yellowstone Lake, which uh, has quite a history in itself with uh, thermal features underneath the lake, quite deep water. Uh, and then beyond the lake are the uh, mountains on the south side of Yellowstone. There's glacial striations right on the crest of this range, indicating flow from the south to the north. Glacial striations are where uh, small rock fragments at the base of the ice uh, scrape across bedrock and leave a scratch, just like kind of like a nail would leave a scratch on wood. Uh, and the polish is the same idea. It's, it's like, uh, like sanding the surface with the base of a glacier. This was quite a, uh, quite a discovery because uh, it was debated how, whether ice got as high as Dunraven Pass. And the main idea was that the ice came from the north and went to the south. But it now appears that in the last glaciation, ice built up to about altitude of 11,000 feet. We're at around a little above 10,000 feet. So ice was uh, a thousand feet higher than us uh, during the last glaciation and overrode the crest of, of this range uh, headed northward towards uh, where it formed an outlet glacier at Gardner and then flowed down the Yellowstone Valley for another uh, 40 miles to its terminus. Well, I'd like to talk a little about the uh, Yellowstone hotspot and some of the things that led up to the discovery of it. When we had done the work in Yellowstone in the uh, late 1960s, uh, Bob Christensen and I knew there was an assemblage of older volcanics that somehow were Yellowstone-like, but an older story than Yellowstone. I knew Lisa Morgan, who had actually uh, done her thesis work on the next older volcanic field than Yellowstone. Uh, and invited her to work with me on this. I um, was able to establish there was a previous volcanic field like Yellowstone. Um, I called it the Heise volcanic field. The last chapter of my dissertation in the conclusions, I said, is this a hot spot? The, everything really crystallized after the 1983 Bora Peak earthquake and we were looking at the distribution of faulting in the whole region and we could see faults on the north side of the Snake River Plain that uh, seemed to be particularly active and we could see that they went on a trend right to Yellowstone 
And then we could see a set of similar faults that, that uh, also were quite active that, that trended down towards uh, Salt Lake City. We also noticed that the Snake River Plain went right, uh, bisected these two trends, and we knew something that there was a volcanic progression. And so then we made this, the first really fancy 3D shaded relief colored map of the whole track of the Snake River Plain. So we started working on this and we started looking up previous people's papers on hot spots and we reasoned since there was previous volcanism to the southwest and there was this, you know, volcanism and faulting were tracking to the northeast, elevation also was going to be tracking to the northeast. So our first paper was uh, the track of the Yellowstone hotspot, volcanism, faulting, and uplift. And we were able to show that there had been uplift of up to a kilometer above the surrounding terrain in the previous volcanism. We've known quite a while that Yellowstone Lake had, had high levels and, and they've come down to lower and lower le levels. We're trying to figure out this inflation and deflation of the caldera, what I called uh, heavy breathing, and uh, got uh, 10 articles in the press by <laughs> using that name. And if you just look at the uh, outlet of Yellowstone Lake from Fishing Bridge to Lahardy Rapids, it looks drowned. It doesn't look like a normal river. It's got sand accumulating uh, in its channel, and it's got a very wide channel, like it's, it's back flooded and drowned an area. So when the uh, Chance came to work with Ken Cannon on some archaeological studies on the shorelines right adjacent to the uh, outlet area. The other thing in my mind was, well, this is a good chance to look to get the kind of information that, that you need to see what's, what's causing this. So in 1990, we began, we began um, work along the north shore of Yellowstone Lake, specifically at, at Fishing Bridge, and, and trying to understand the effect of what what seems to be this um, this heavy breathing and its relationship to to the archaeology. Uh, Ken, uh, I was out to uh, dug a hole in uh, the, the uh, far end of this uh, barrier beach last last uh, year, and it's really curious. Um, you know, this is a site where we got the Hannah Point, uh, maybe four thousand years old, and uh, up there you find. Um, uh, young beach, beach sands and gravels about the eighth thick sitting on a buried soil and uh, you know this does sort of help confirm the idea that that the lake has just come up and is burying older landforms with uh, young sediment and uh, this soil there really really proves that. In 1998, Ken hiked into the Black Canyon of the Yellowstone with good friend and former chief naturalist of Yellowstone, John Good, to survey Crevice Lake and the controversial glacial age deposits. You know, uh, 50 years ago, the only thing we could have called this was a moraine, but uh, That's right. it ain't. <laughs> That's right. It, uh, people would argue that it was a moraine, that it sure as hell isn't. But the size of the boulders is what gets me. That granite, golly Moses, what a beautiful thing. Near the end of the last glaciation, ice dams occasionally formed in the upper Yellowstone drainage. When an ice dam would finally succumb to the water pressure, catastrophic floods ripped through the Black Canyon, redistributing moraines and scouring the terrain in a slurry of mud, sand, trees, and boulders. The waters eventually emptied into the wide Yellowstone Valley near the town of Gardner today. You know, we have this nice a low gradient ridge with a uh, negative slope on the back side of it uh, up against the valley wall and uh, this clearly demonstrates this is a deposit that's that's laid in here and uh, it represents the flood height um, of this big flood probably multiple floods that came down the black canyon of the yellowstone uh, during late glacial time and we're standing here 300 feet above the yellowstone river so this was quite a rushing torrent, 300 feet deep. Ken, this, this is a fascinating lake, and I think 
you were telling me you wanted to do something this coming winter here? Core the sediments in it or something? How in the world do you do that? Um, well, it, logistically, it's it's quite a feat because we're uh, uh, five miles or so from uh, from where we can get to it with vehicles, and this uh, lake's 90 feet deep, and uh, we're going to have to be able to uh, put in a casing down 90 feet and then core the bottom of the lake. And uh, well, something that'll work well if we can bring it off would be to helicopter in the uh, in the casing and coring equipment and several people, and. Uh, when the lake's frozen uh, in maybe late February or early March when it's got good uh, ice on it. Mm -hmm. uh, set up a platform out there and put all this stuff together, uh, cased at the bottom of the lake and then take a core into the bottom. Well, when I walk through Yellowstone a lot, the types of questions that go through my head are things like, when did the forest form? How long has it looked this way? How sensitive is it to environmental changes? And to get that information, you really have to sort of leave the forest and go to lakes to look for it, because lakes are great repositories of environmental information. Ken joined paleoecologist Kathy Whitlock in the winter of 2001 to core the uniquely tranquil glacial-aged lake. The thing that makes crevice really special is that the sediments are annually laminated, and by that when you look at the sediments, you can see light and dark layers that represent deposition during each winter and deposition during each summer. So it looks in some ways like a tree ring record. And it should be possible for us to lay out these cores and actually count them, starting with year zero at the present day, back all the way back, hopefully to the beginning of the last glaciation. Truly an, a multidisciplinary study going on here. So we're not just using one type of fossil or one type of uh, indicator to reconstruct climate. We're coming at it from a whole bunch of different angles and for that reason I think uh, it's going to be just you know very well studied and very much used by other people that are interested in climate change. Okay so in 2020 we're having this big discussion about how come some of the Mary Bay looks like it's subaerial and how come some of it looks like it's subaqueously deposited. We're going back and forth and what could happen in his terraces and stuff. And he calls me one day in the middle of hot summer and in 2020 and he says, Lisa. And I said, hi, Ken. He says, well, I want to start that conversation again. And I said, where are you? And he said, I'm in REI in Bozeman. I said, where's Linda? Linda's out in the car. I said, isn't it hot? It was a hot July day in Boulder. He said, no, she's OK. She's just sleepy. And so we go immediately into the geo zone about this particular issue. And so we're going back and forth. I mean, that's how we work together. I mean, we just didn't follow. We didn't always agree. And, um, and you know, 15, and people are coming up and asking, can they help him? No, no, I'm just fine. And he's wandering around the store. And all of a sudden, probably, 20 minutes into our conversation, you hear this, Ken, what are you doing? And he said, oh, hi, Linda. And he said, I'm talking to Lisa. And he, she said, what are you talking about? Geology, Yellowstone Lake, explosions. And he, she said, you were supposed to come in here and get this, I don't know, gloves or something. We are going home now. And so he said, uh, um, I, in, do you want to talk with Lisa, Linda? No, I want to go home. <laughs> and so it was just, you know, 